Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the launch of Anne Henderson's new book, Menzies versus Evert, The Great Rivalry of Australian Politics. I'm Georgina Downer. I am the CEO of the Robert Menzies Institute, based here in the old quadrangle where you are um, at the University of Melbourne. And it's so wonderful to see so many of you braving this beautiful Melbourne spring weather. I am rather naughtily going to start this event without our guest speaker. Um, he, has, he has been experiencing some traffic delays on Russell Street. So we're going to tip our event um, upside down and start at the end, not the beginning. I hope you don't mind. Um, I would like to acknowledge some very special guests tonight. I think Ian Harper, Robert Menzies Institute board member is here as well as the former member for the seat that was once known as Melbourne Ports, Michael Danby. It's lovely to see you. Thank you for coming along. And uh, members of the Robert Menzies Institute, our supporters and Japara Club members, thank you so much for all you do to make all our work possible. The Robert Menzies Institute, for those of you, and I think there's quite a few of you in the room tonight who are new to our events, is Australia's sixth prime ministerial library and museum we are very proud to be based here at the University of Melbourne, the university that Sir Robert Menzies, Australia's longest serving Prime Minister, attended as a law student. And in fact, in this very building, which was once a law school, and this building was indeed the first building of the university, uh, this is where he did his law degree in the early 20th century. And then it's actually the building he returned to as Chancellor of the university from 1967 to 72. In 1976, just two years before he died, he decided to donate his entire personal library to this university of four and a half thousand books, uh, certainly bigger than my library, although I am led to believe that others have much larger collections, so, you know, maybe <laughs> <laughs> something to aspire to anyway, but uh, this library that resides in the Bailiu uh, to this very day is something that we take great pride of in the Robert Menzies Institute and display in our museum. I hope some of you were able to go and see our museum downstairs in the East Wing. And before we do hear from Greg, who is imminently arriving, I hope, and of course Anne, the author of this great new book, I would like to ask our curator of the exhibition and librarian, William Cook, to speak about the new ex exhibition. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, you can do so. We're open to the public Monday to Thursday and, uh, and love having visitors. And Will does give a very, very good tour, I can assure you of that. So thank you, Will. It's a pleasure to take over Greg as the keynote speaker this evening. Um, but um, in, now, in no way to detract from the, the excitement of this book launch, I feel it is also appropriate um, that we acknowledge today the latest Menzies exhibition has been officially launched. Um, now, some here may know, uh, as Georgina just mentioned, I'm the librarian for the, the Institute and I, I regularly I work in the museum and have helped to curate the latest display, which I have to say is exceptional, and I think probably the best selection of works we have ever had. I know I carry on about this from time to time, but there are over four and a half thousand books to choose from for his personal collection. So Georgina, I, and the team inevitably end up in long discussions as to what can fit in and what themes would be most educational and of the greatest interest to our visitors. Uh, Georgina tends to like the books on politics and philosophy, whereas I like Menzies' cricket books and comedy books like Keith Dunstan's Wowzers. I don't know why that term has gone out of fashion in recent years. Um, I thought perhaps because Wowzers have been in fashion in our state over, in recent time. But it is perhaps lucky Georgina is in charge, otherwise we might just have a selection of no doubt politically incorrect comedy books and Menzies cricket almanacs on display for the next six months. However, we are most fortunate as the cricket book issue is now, at least has now been resolved with the 
Some of you may have noticed if you were in there this evening, um, with a deep thanks to Robert Menzies' nephew, John Menzies, who unfortunately could not be here this evening, um, but it would nevertheless be remiss not to note his great support for making the museum realise its full potential. He has recently donated the most exciting collection of cricket books from Sir Robert's very own collection, which were given to him by Robert, uh, many of which are inscribed to Sir Robert Menzies by leading cricketers and cricket journalists of the era. I was first of all shocked to discover that there were more in the MCC and then from John in addition to the enormous amount of cricket books in the Bailey Library. But as someone who has fondly spent many hours with Sir Robert in his study in his life, John has gone to enormous lengths to help us recreate the very feel of it in the museum with this tremendous addition, which I'm sure will continue to improve over time. We are most grateful for his contribution and the books can now all be seen right beside Sir Robert's old desk from Haverbrack Avenue in the museum forevermore. I would expect everyone would have seen the museum earlier this evening, but for those who have had poor time management, um, not to mention anyone in particular, uh, um, uh, when, when, when you have a free morning or afternoon, please come in to see the latest changeover of books. Um, amongst a whole host of incredibly fascinating items and cabinets, most appropriately for this evening, we have what I would call the legal legacy display. Um, this, free, this features several texts inscribed by no other than Doc Evert to Robert Menzies. Um, as well, books annotated by Menzies on Owen Dixon and Evert's contrasting star, styles of judgment, and even a personal Lord notebook of Menzies from when he was at, a student at Melbourne University. Other themes that feature for this exhibition are the burgeoning of Menzies' liberal thought, such as in his personal highlighted co copies of John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, and Thomas Jefferson's diaries. And we also have a particularly fo strong focus on Menzies' passion and concerns for enhancing standards for higher education, which clearly remained a lifelong passion. I am more obsessed with the collection than anyone, so if you ever would like a tour, please book me in, as I love sharing my thrill and interest about the incredible items on display. Thank you all very much, and Hopefully, I don't need to speak for another few minutes, Georgina, but I can. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm do a Q&A. <laughs> okay. uh, perfect timing, Greg. <laughs> Uh, while Greg just uh, takes off his, no doubt, very wet coat, uh, I, uh, I will introduce Greg, who needs, I know, very, very little introduction to all of you. Um, Greg is the Australian's foreign editor. He is one of Australia's most significant commentators on national security policy and foreign policy, and you will no doubt read him in the Australian newspaper, but also see him on television and radio. Uh, he is a must read always. Um, he also writes extensively on culture and religion, and I am extremely pleased to welcome him here tonight. This is his debut performance at the Robert Menzies Institute, and, uh, and it's an absolute pleasure to, to hear from you, Greg. Thank you. Georgina, ladies and gentlemen, Georgina just sent one of her colleagues to go and find me because, oh, Michael, my great friend, uh, um, I was David Cragg as I live and breathe, good grief. Uh, a, face, a face from the past. I could tell you a few stories about David Cragg, let me tell you. But um, no, I, 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 I apologise profusely to Anne and to everyone for being a bit late. You know, the definition of journal, I blame it on my profession of journalism. The definition of journalism, the proper definition, is human frailty, somewhat exaggerated. And um, 
I, I hovered, helicopter-like, searching for a park near Melbourne University, swooping on one and then another and finding it was disabled or no, you know, no middle-aged white men who may have once not have voted Green May Park or, or, or whatever it said. Finally, I found a place and then it said you have to have a ticket and of course it was impossible. There's no way to get a ticket and it, you think this is just the normal George Orwell quality of Melbourne University but Georgina told me that it's an app, you need an app. And, uh, so you used to be able to pay with coins, and I resented it when you had to pay with credit cards, but now you can't pay with a credit card either. And uh, so it's barely possible, because the time runs out in 10 minutes, that I've engaged in an act of civil disobedience. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's great to be with you, so I really apologise for keeping everyone waiting for 10 minutes, and um, I have to beg forgiveness. It's a joy and an honour to be asked to launch Anne's book. Uh, this is a wonderful book, Menzies versus Ebert. And um, uh, it's quite wrong to regard any high achieving, accomplished, distinguished, successful woman in reference to her other half. But you have to remark that the Hendersons as a couple are a powerhouse of Australian history and ideas. And, um, they make a fantastic contribution. Uh, Anne has chosen really to specialise in the history of the Menzies era and, and before. So not just the Menzies era, before that as well, of course. But she has written a great deal about the Menzies period. And I think in choosing the 1950s, she has quite selfishly chosen the most fun decade in Australian history, really. Um, you know, uh, like Anne, I, I have the addiction of writing books, and um, it's best not to start. It's a lot like heroin. Don't, don't do your first one, because you can never stop after that. You know, uh, um, I, I used to say, writing a book is as near as a bloke gets to the experience of childbirth. You know, you have a very happy moment of conception, and a long, increasingly uncomfortable period of gestation, an agonising climax of delivery and you think, oh God, will this never end? And your first thought is, I'm never going to do that again. Then you see the little fella and he looks quite clever and you think, well, it might be fun if there was another one, you know, and five minutes later you're back in exactly the same position. But um, as I grow older, of course, I know that I'm soon getting, getting closer and closer to, to the, my encounter with my maker and so the last few books I've, and of course, if you've spent a long time in journalism, I've been a professional journalist for 45 years, so there's quite a lot to live down, a lot on the negative side of the ledger. So try to put a few things in the positive side of the ledger. So my last couple of books have been about Christianity. And this is relevant to Anne's book. The connection is going to dazzle you in a minute. Um, the, and in the first book about Christianity I wrote, I read all the new atheists, and they particularly loved attacking the God of the Old Testament. They, they, were, sort of, they were very anti-Jewish, the new atheists. They, they were saying, you know, the God of the Old Testament is misogynistic and racist and genocidal and uh, authoritarian and all kinds of other things. And Jewish friends of mine have said, well, if that's, the, if that's the God we worship, what does that say about us? So as a result of reading all the new atheists, which was very tedious, I then thought, well, I'd better read the Old Testament, like most Catholics. I'd spent no time in Scripture, and certainly none in the Old Testament, you know. And what I found was that the Old Testament was enormous fun. It was not only full of wisdom and grace and beauty, but it was great fun. You know, Jonah, like a foreign correspondent, didn't want to go and redeem the Ninevites, you know. He wanted them to suffer their horrible fate was sent on a foreign assignment and uh, so like a good journalist who hates his assignment, he went on a cruise instead and God behaving just like a good news corporation editor caused there to be a storm, cut off his expenses and flung him in the belly of a whale. Very normal News Corp sort of experience. And, uh, and all through the Old Testament, it's terrific fun and I had no idea that it would be so much fun. Ruth, the most beautiful uh, story human literature has ever produced, Job, the most profound meditation of innocent suffering, and so on. Now, how does that relate to Anne's book? Analogous to the Old Testament is the 1950s. So the popular view of the 1950s, promulgated by 
labour legend making, I don't mean brilliant labour historians like David Craig and Michael Danby, but you know, more captious, foolish labour uh, uh, legend makers, has popularised the idea that the 1950s was terribly dull and conformist and nothing interesting happened and it was all retrograde and all reactionary and all backward looking and all a god king country, all empire loyalty. And of course, in fact, as with most left legends, this is the complete reverse of the truth. The 1950s was the most dynamic, creative, brilliant uh, decade in Australian history. Australian political history is absolutely absorbing. The only people who find Australian political history dull are those who have no acquaintance with Australian political history. I'm very devoted to Alfred Deakin, and surely there is no more eccentric person in the whole of Western politics ever to be Prime Minister of anywhere than Alfred Deakin. You know, he was a theosophist, and uh, uh, he was a nut, and he was a journalist, and he desperately wrote because he desperately needed money all his life. He was a free trader until he went to work for a proprietor who was a protectionist, and then he became a protectionist. What a good journalist he was, really. And, uh, and this stream of eccentrics and geniuses runs through Australian politics. They're the most colourful, vivid people. George Reid, Henry Parks, astonishing, Tosspot, Toby Barton, all of them, and none more so than Evert and um, Menzies. Just staying with the 1950s for a second. The 1950s was that decade, in my view, I, I agree with um, David Love's interpretation in his biography of Percy Spender. It was the decade in which something of the American spirit entered into the Australian soul. And Australia became a very dynamic, forward-looking, very, very expansive, energetic nation. And look at what the 1950s gave us. We forged, all of it, by the way, under Menzies' Prime Ministership, we forged the US-Australia military alliance. We'd been angling for this since Alfred Deakin invited Teddy Roosevelt's fleet to visit Australia. We'd been trying to get it. The post-war Labor government tried to get it, couldn't get it. Percy Spender got it, more or less against Menzies' opposition. And Menzies, of course, being a very, very gifted Prime Minister, something he opposed turned out to be great. He naturally changed his mind and took credit for it and basked in all the glory of it of what a good Prime Minister he was. And uh, we uh, had, I think, I'd have to triple check the figures, but I think we had the biggest migration program we've ever had in our history as a percentage of the population throughout the 50s. We diversified our migrant source in the 50s. Um, Mediterranean migrants, East Europeans. We didn't end the white Australia policy until the 60s, but I, I went to school from the very beginning of the 1960s, and I had classmates from Singapore and Papua New Guinea and so on. So there were quite a few Asians in Australia even before the end of the white Australia policy. But I had classmates you know, we sat, sat alphabetically, so there was Saad from Lebanon, Scarfoni from Italy, you know, Shanahan's and Sheridan's from Irish, uh, Irish background, Torian from, from Italy, uh, Rodriguez, uh, I remember, was a Eurasian from, uh, from Singapore. Uh, so we diversified our population. We had a big sense of national security, as you'd expect, after the uh, experience of World War II. We understood we need a much bigger population, we want to be a big, strong nation. We made lots of things. Now, this is regarded as terribly retrograde in economic policy, but, you know, we were one of the richest and most successful countries in the world with a fantastic democratic uh, system. Uh, we had always rejected British honours, so there was quite a limit to our Britishness. In the 1950s, 1956, we hosted the Melbourne Olympics. What an astonishing thing for us to do, to host the Worldwide Olympics. We got television. Um, there was quite a limit to our Britishness, as I say, because we never, we never wanted imperial honours. Going back to my other hero, Deacon, he twice rejected honorary doctorates from Oxford. And he didn't do it in a public showy way. He just thought he shouldn't be under any sense of obligation to what was the instrument of a foreign government, namely the British government. And Oxford was pretty surprised, you know. Not that many people 
reject honorary doctorates from Oxford, and he did it very politely. He later rejected an honorary doc doctorate from Cambridge as well. And as I say, Oxford came back a second time, and he said, no, 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 still not interested. When he'd become old and senile and um, not very capable, he did take an honorary doctorate from a Californian university. But uh, Deacon, like Spender, had a tremendously American focus. Uh, and the infusion of American influence. Now, it's a paradox with Menzies, of course, because Menzies was so British. Anyway, those are my general thoughts about the 1950s. But to move on more specifically to Anne's uh, lovely book. So Anne is really an accomplished author, a really accomplished author. And she has a distinctive style. She is a pane of perfectly clear glass between the reader and the material. She doesn't. Uh, inject herself into the story and try to say all the time, look at me, look at me, look at me. Some other writers do that. I can't think of one offhand, but <laughs> some, some other writers do that quite a lot. Uh, you know, the vertical pronoun figures very heavily in their, uh, in their prose. Um, I read a review just last week in The Spectator of um, a biography of Joan Didion, which said this is, this is a book in that very great class of books about really interesting people written by really dull people who are nonetheless determined to tell you all about themselves. And, uh, and uh, all of us can face that temptation. But of course, the pellucid clarity with which Anne approaches a subject ought not to be mistaken for a lack of perfect style. Rather, it is that art which conceals an art, the most difficult art of all. When something reads very smoothly, very graciously, very easily, when there's no difficulty, when it's very, very readable, that's not an easy thing to do. That's a very difficult thing to do. That is that art which conceals an art. Um, and this book uh, exemplifies that. I was thinking, if you were looking for a more um, uh, extravagant um, simile, to title this book Menzies versus Evett. You could have said it's like Joan Sutherland versus Lady Gaga or uh, Muhammad, e, Muhammad Ali versus Joe Bugner or something. Anne is very gracious and very polite to Evett all the way through. But she can't quite conceal the fact that he was barking mad. And, uh, and he had possibly the worst judgment of any political leader in the history of the world. One of the great highlights of the book, of course, is the, what Anne calls the Molotov moment, where you know, Vladimir Petrov um, defects from the Soviet uh, intelligence agency to Australia. By the way, the Petrov affair, just to digress again for a second, the Petrov affair reflects extraordinary credit on Australia in the 1950s, because almost every other senior KGB defector <coughs> in the Cold War was a walk-in. Western intelligence was very rarely successful in cultivating a KGB officer and convincing them to defect. Very, very rarely did they do that. Almost every other high-value defector was a walk-in, and as a result, later in the Cold War, there's a real worry whether some of the walk-ins were not, in fact, double agents, like Gordievsky. But Petrov was an ASIO operation. ASIO set out to cultivate Petrov, set out to compromise Petrov, set out to attach him to the idea of staying in Australia. Now, as Anne makes clear, Petrov was also worried that the politics between Beria and, uh, you know, Stalin and everyone else in the back home was going to result in him getting uh, executed if he went home. So a, the Soviets certainly helped, no doubt. But you can't take credit away from ASIO. So this was an astonishing achievement by ASIO and led to a great deal of the intimacy which we enjoy in the Five Eyes intelligence um, uh, arrangements. ASIO won respect internationally because of the volume of information and detail that Vladimir and Evdokia Petrov uh, um, came up with. One thing I'd very much like Anne to address in her remarks, she's very gracious <coughs> and fair towards everyone. She writes fascinatingly about John Burton and comments that Burton seems to have been overseeing the espionage activities of Ian Milner. So we all know that Des Ball, 
the late great scholar Des Ball, man of the left but very, very honest scholar, uh, believed that Burden was in fact himself a Soviet agent. So I'd like Anne to tell us very clearly whether Burton was a Soviet agent or not. Yes or no, or what is her view of the matter um, uh, and where that stands. But Anne, uh, Anne highlights the Molotov moment. Now, you'll all know the, the history of that. Uh, Petrov is defected. Um, he's brought a lot of information with him. Some of it shows that people on Ebert's staff were in fact Soviet, uh, were providing information to the Soviet Union if they weren't full-scale Soviet agents. Ebert thinks this is all a terrible conspiracy directed against him. As well as being mad, he's a narcissist and he thinks everything in the universe is centred on him. And uh, he writes to the Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov saying, excuse me, my dear, my dear comrade, do you have any spies in Australia? Is Petrov a spy? Could you let me know this? And there's a beautiful passage in Anne's book where she says, um, she just recounts Everett's speech. So I'll just, you'll indulge me, I'll just, just read a bit of this. There's no warning for those who helped Everett prepare his speech. So this is the speech in which Everett reveals his answer from Molotov. The speech that went for two hours in the House of Representatives. Don't we wish we had speeches going for two hours now? On the evening of 19 October 1955, he told no one of his latest move. Um, Everett believed he had a trump card up his sleeve. As reported on the front page of the left-leaning Argus the following day, the headline said it all. I wanted to check the Petrov papers, Everett wrote to Molotov, and he replied, they're false. Telling this to a stunned house a few minutes into his speech, Everett explained that he did it because, quotes, he wanted to ascertain the truth of these grave matters. And continues, Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov had given Everett the answer he sought replying that the documents handed over by the Petrovs can only be as it had been made clear at that time and as it was confirmed later, falsifications fabricated on the instructions of persons interested in the deterioration of the Soviet-Australian relationship and in discrediting their political opponents. And continues, whatever rationalisations followed from Everett for the better part of two hours after this, amid interjections and laughter and a house the speaker could barely control, Nothing he said would prove his allegations about the documents. It mattered little. His case was lost with one false and manic move. And uh, I think Anne further comments that many people thought that Ebert's leadership effectively ended at that moment, although, of course, he lingered like some terrible ghost in the Labor Party, causing immense harm and damage uh, for, for years and years afterwards. Um, this... Uh, this book is also full of wonderful rhymes for today. So history doesn't really repeat, but it does rhyme. So the account of the 1951 Communist Party, uh, the referendum, so the, the Menzies government legislates to ban the Communist Party. Uh, the legislation is thrown out by the High Court. So then the Menzies government goes to a referendum to get the Communist Party uh, banned through constitutional amendment. Of course, we can't help but look at the parallel with today. They're, they're not the same sort of cause. I'm not drawing any moral equivalents or anything. But there is a certain procedural uh, instructiveness about what happened. Menzies starts the cause with 70 or 80 percent approval for his proposition. It's an anti-communist period, as it should have been. Communists were a threat to Australia. They certainly were. It was right to try to limit their influence. That's absolutely true. It was a hard question, what can a free society do to defend itself against those who would destroy its freedom? But of course, the method that Menzies chose was absolutely wrong to ban the Communist Party and to change the constitution to give the government the authority to do that kind of thing. So it was a good sentiment, widely supported, overwhelmingly supported by the, government, uh, by the population but a very bad mechanism. And he was opposed chiefly by Everett, who had really not that much credit with the Australian people. But Everett won that battle. It's perhaps the only significant battle Everett ever won against Menzies, and thank God that he did. Well done, the Australian people. They voted no to the referendum. So an immensely popular idea, immensely powerful Prime Minister, 
fit absolutely with the ethos of the times, and the Australian people rejected it. Now that would seem to be very similar to what's going on now. I'm not silly enough to make a forecast about what will happen in October 14. The yes case is apparently spending something like half a million dollars a day in Sydney and Melbourne, and in politics, big money talks, there's no doubt. So any result is possible. But nonetheless, there are enduring characteristics in the Australian people, which is surprising in a way. We're, we're such a strongly immigrant nation. So many of our people are, 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 are new, which is a wonderful thing, something I support absolutely. And then our schools are determined not to teach any history, much less Australian history, unless, of course, it's just to say that Australia is like the Old Testament, God, wicked, patriarchal, sexist, uh, genocidal, homophobic, whatever. Um, and yet, this deep conservatism, this deep wisdom of Australian people, this reluctance to change the Constitution, this sense that, no, 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 you politicians, you present us your programs and we'll vote on them, you can more or less do anything you like, and if we don't like it, we'll throw you out, but you're not going to change the Constitution on us. That is really an enduring reality. So it was a very bad misjudgment of Menzies, but it shows also Menzies' greatness because he came back from that misjudgment and then established a complete dominance over Ebert over time. The final point I'd make is two, two final points about, uh, about Menzies. Although Anne writes in this gracious and easy style, she's not uh, immune to jokes and good moments. So Menzies and Evett both were incredibly arrogant and they're both pretty brainy and they both made it clear to their colleagues that they were much brainier than the colleagues. Although, although Menzies had some pretty formidable folks around him, Haslack, Spender, uh, Casey. Uh, this is a very high quality front bench which Menzies quickly got rid of so that he, you know, he, they, they weren't there to, to be an alternative to him. But, um, Menzies was often a bit rebarbative and a bit, uh, even a bit sort of surly, a bit of a bully with his colleagues and uh, let them know when he thought they were talking rubbish, which was a lot of the time. But he was having one evening with them that was where he was gracious and engaging and everybody was having a good time and uh, one of his colleagues said to him, Bob, you know, why aren't you like this all the time? He said, you know, the problem with you, Bob, is that you, you just don't suffer fools gladly. To which Menzies replied, well, what do you think I'm doing right now? <laughs> and uh, Anne comments that this rather destroyed the, the, uh, the benefit of the evening, you know, the, the bonding of the evening. But then my final thought is reading, uh, so in this, in this lovely book, Anne quotes liberally from uh, primary sources, and reading Menzies' rhetoric, it's a very effective rhetoric, but it's actually, it reminded me quite a lot of John Howard. It's not a sort of super brilliant parliamentary rhetoric. There's no doubt Gough Whitlam used to have super brilliant parliamentary rhetoric sometimes. But super brilliant parliamentary rhetoric doesn't really win you any votes. It, it might wound your enemies. It might impress your colleagues. I remember somebody telling me once, so I, I'm a great admirer of Peter Costello. I think he made a fabulous contribution to Australia. I remember somebody telling me once that every cabinet debate that he won, he left someone feeling sore and grumpy and wounded. You know, and brilliant, super brilliant genius parliamentary rhetoric is often so clever. You know, God save the Queen for nothing will save the Governor General, and then you lose the election by one of the greatest landslides in Australian history. You know, whereas reading Menzies' rhetoric here, it can often be pretty tough, pretty hard. He, he had some very hard things to say about Evan, but he doesn't sort of disguise his point in some ultra clever literary reference. Uh, and, and I remember I've interviewed John Howard many, many times in the course of my 45 years in journalism. And he would often say things like, uh, I'd ask him about his attitude to the military and he'd say, well, I'm always inclined to stand up for the military. So Gareth Evans, if he'd had the same disposition, would have said something like, an exquisite appreciation of the distinctive contribution of the profession of arms is not something to which I'm indifferent. And uh, and who's the more effective politician? And uh, Menzies, I think, was uh, as brilliant as Evett. But of course, abstract IQ isn't the point. It's, it's combined with judgment and leadership and character and everything else. And Menzies certainly 
I mean, he didn't have quite as many legal appointments as Ebert because he was busy doing something else, to wit being Prime Minister. And um, I was interested uh, to read quite a bit of Menzies' rhetoric in Anne's book again and just see sort of how down to earth it is, how any normal person listening to Parliament would understand exactly what Menzies meant and would get the point, even when he was being sarcastic and, um, and very tough on Ebert, there wouldn't have been any, any difficulty about following Menzies' argument. The normal person could just nod along and say, yeah, that makes sense to me. But of course, you know, you can't completely dismiss the element of blind luck here and having an opponent like Ebert uh, is an extraordinary good fortune for any, uh, for any political leader. So I want to declare Anne's book launched and I wish it every success. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Greg. That was wonderful and I'm sorry about the parking situation at this district and, uh, yeah, Big Brother is determined to, to hunt you down with its <laughs> use of apps. Um, and I'd like to invite you to come and respond to Greg. Uh, Anne is the Deputy Director of the Sydney Institute. She is the editor of the Sydney Papers Online and she is quite a fantastic biographer. She's written biographies on Damien Ed Lyons, on former Prime Minister and husband of Enid Lyons, Joe Lyons, along with Menzies at War and now Menzies versus Everett. So please welcome Anne. Thank you. Well, at this point you tear up your notes. Thank you, Greg. I remember you well. I went to Sydney many years ago with Jared, and uh, I think uh, we weren't, I think he was working for John Howard or something like that. But when we got to Sydney, we got to know various people around Greg in the Labor right. Um, some people over there would probably know what I'm talking about, and they would put on these marvelous nights where they would. Um, ad lib, get up, make these wonderful speeches. It was a kind of a contest between them. And uh, I used to sit there in awe of their wordsmith abilities and their presentation abilities. So Greg, I'm really honored. We've gone from the Bible to um, the 50s to American foreign policy. Well, I was beginning to wonder whether Menzies and Everett ever get back to, to, to be launched, but no, you did a fabulous job and thank you very much, Greg. I also should thank you all for coming, because we couldn't do it without you. Um, Connor Court and Anthony Capello, thank you very much um, for doing it. And Paige Helley, who works with us at Sydney Bouquets for a terrific cover. Um, but as you pointed out, Greg, um, the 1951 referendum um, was very important, I thought, because I, Jared was talking about it endlessly at home. It was so close, you know, it was a referendum that didn't really have the margin of winning for no that other referendums have. And there's a lot to be learned from it. So going through what happened in the 51 referendum on the Communist Party dissolution was fascinating. And it was where Evert, I guess, kind of did a, re a revival of himself um, after the deep, dark moments when Labor had lost at 49. He was now where he always wanted to be. He was the leader of the Labor Party and he used the referendum to make himself known, not to the Australian public as much as to, known to the Labor Party as a leader. It ended with a very close vote, but it went from that 70 to 80% in favor of yes to a very slim margin in favor of no. Now, I, I wanted to get the politics of it, and I interviewed John Howard and Michael Kirby, who launched the book in Sydney, opposites politically, gorgeous old icons of Australia and politics and the law. They both were about 11 or 12 during the referendum, and they recalled the atmospherics of the campaign. They were very young Australians, but politically switched on. Um, Michael Kirby had a step-grandparent who was a member of, a significant member of the Communist Party and he was a nice guy and he was very kind to the family. And so I was getting below it to what happened to people. But it was very, very divisive. 
Um, and you can imagine with such a narrow win, it was right down the middle. John Howard said it was the only occasion, he said this a number of times, where his parents voted differently. Mum for no and dad for yes. Though they didn't get divorced over it. I talked to Penelope Seidler on email. She was a niece, a niece of Bert Evert. She went to a very conservative school on the North Shore in Sydney and she felt frozen out. Um, <clears throat> it was enormously divisive. I sp we spoke to Michael Bohm, who was a former Liberal senator and very pro-Liberal, but he was for the no case, strongly. There was a division in the Liberal Party uh, and the Communist Party was sort of a big black bear for those who <coughs> were wanting to vote yes. And it was very, we talk about the kind of, um, we now call it race, well, in this, this particular referendum, we talk about racism and whatever, but referendums bring out really nasty extremes. And this is one of the things that Menzies said at one of his meetings. It was a very rowdy meeting, and in, in some ways, the rowdiness of his meetings was such that he didn't do as, anything like as many public meetings as, as ever, because all the only publicity he got was just how badly rowdy and nasty were his meetings. And in one of them he yelled out to a, Hitler, a heckler who had called him Heil Hitler, had greeted him with Heil Hitler, yelled, he said to him, you call me Hitler and Dr. Evert calls me Goebbels. Make up your mind. But they, they were literally calling each other Nazis. So in all of this, there was a much larger story, and it was of two giants in politics and the law of Australia, and they were so directly opposed, not just in a contest. And so I went back, um, they contested three federal elections and the referendum. In all of that, Everett lost all of the elections, but he won the referendum. But if you look at them, there are no two contestants in Australian political history that affected each other as much as those two particularly Everett, uh, and no book to date has tracked it. There's a biography of, he of Everett and here and a biography of Menzies there, but those two together have never been looked at. And so the book is not about the life of Menzies, the life of Everett. It's about what are the bouts, what are the, the, the confrontations, the big confrontations that show you how politics was played where it ended up, and how these two people were so significant in where it did end up. So I'm looking at the divide. It was a personal rivalry. I used Peter Crockett from his biography, some of the letters that were exchanged between them just before Everett became a member of parliament. And the way in which Menzies responded to a letter Everett had written to him Everett took particularly uh, as a uh, as an um, affront that he hadn't Menzies had not treated him with the respect of a member of the High Court, and equally Menzies found Everett utterly irritating because he thought he all he wanted to do is get to politics and be the leader of the Labor Party and be the Prime Minister, and he wasn't interested in anybody else. So they both had. Um, the dears of their life. Um, Menzies had given up the Prime Ministership in 1941. In 1944-45, he came back remodelling the non-Labour side of politics and creating the Liberal Party with a lot of other people. So he overcame a certain amount of that weakness that Greg uh, illustrated in that very funny um, Spender has it in his book, The Older Spender, not John, his father, uh, Percy Spender the night that he told everyone he was suffering feels gladly after he'd been so nice to them all. I mean, how bad can you get in the sense of trying to win people's confidence? Um, but Menzies came back and there are letters with his brother, uh, Sid, who told him he was up himself a bit a lot of the time and he should mend his ways in the, in the time of his uh, demise. So he is a creator. He, he brings the party back. He builds a party with others. Um, Everett had a similar dive after the 1949 election. He wanted to leave, but the party wouldn't let him. The structures outside the party in those days were very strong. So he stumbled on. He had had a high during the years of the Chifley Curtin government as the Minister for External, External Affairs and Attorney General. He saw himself as the um, midwife of the United Nations. He was 
the first, or one of the first um, presidents of the assembly, and it was a great achievement. But he was always a very cantankerous character, and many who worked with him left, have left records that show that he could be very nasty, run hot and cold, be very narcissistic, and he was very self uh, determined. It was all about, uh, even Michael Kirby, having read the book, said, Yes, I have to agree, it was all about Emmett. But he, after the um, end of the Second World War, and I can't go into this now, but Evett, as an external affairs minister, was a very indifferent um, minister to the idea of confidentiality. He left serious documents all over his desk. He was a very disorganised sort of person. People were always cleaning up after him. But John Burton, I haven't tracked, I can't tell you the answer to your question on John Burton, but as head of the, well, uh, more, more serious scholars than I on this, you know, I should have not been able to prove it. But Burton, Burton um, <coughs> sort of ran cover for Ian Milner, who was a spy, and there's a lot of ways in which you can say Burton was an agency for many who were doing um, the spying or leaking or fellow travellers who helped Soviet embassies, wherever. Um, but in that period, um, the United States and Britain so distrusted Australia because of effort that they would not uh, let Chifley know about the Venona transcripts. We had a level of trust with Pakistan. And that's why we started ASIO, or Chifley set it up, because when he was finally told that there was a problem with our external affairs department and that we couldn't rely on it not to leak, ASIO began. It didn't really get any teeth until Menzies took over, and it was only then that the United States and America began to take Australia seriously. So, <clears throat> at that time, as we would say um, in these digital times, the vibe was around Everett that he sort of trusted the big powers equally. It, and, and Russia had been an ally in the Second World War. But the problem with it, he saw, he distrusted Japan endlessly. He disagreed with the trade agreement with Japan in 1957. And he, he, he even had problems with CETA when it was set up. And Paul Hasluck put his figure on it when he said that the problem with Everett was he thought Stalin wanted to win the war, when in fact Stalin wanted to win the world. So, um, after, <clears throat> I, I, I'm taking the bout, so I go back to the 40s with the banking legislation, okay, deal with that. But when, it got, when Menzies was in government, Menzies um, said about the referendum, lost the referendum, but at that point in time, Australia was suffering inflation, the Queen visited, they got inflation under control, the government was going well, and then Petrov defected. So the 54 election, Labor thought they were going to win it because of inflation, a bit like now, easy pickings. Um, the defection of Petrov was the moment when Everett went along with the inquiry, went along with the Royal Commission, whatever, but from that moment, his problem was that after the 50-year election when he lost, he saw Petrov's affection as must have been the trick that Menzies had pulled out of his hat, the rabbit out of the hat, to bring about um, a distrust of Everett and he lost the election. In fact, it was all about the economy and <clears throat> I've explained all that, you can work that out. But as with um, Greg's summation, the whole Petrov thing happened after the 54 election. And the tragedy in all of that was that not only did it destroy um, Evert, it also destroyed the Labor Party for a long time. And when you read um, Paul Strangio's book on the split and what they did in Victoria, anyone in a political, with a political sense today could not imagine how the Labor Party suicided. Down in Victoria, they sacked branch after branch after branch. They expelled MPs. Jeff Crean down here, his uncle, was one of the many who lost their seats. It was just crazy. And it all happened because Everett was convinced that this little group of anti-communists, Bob Santa Maria had let him down in the 54 election, had taken his bait and been nice to him, whatever. 
All of these people had conspired against him. And the Petrov Commission, which named some of Evett's staff, and which he then went before the Commission to defend, it all fell apart. But it, the falling apart of Evett is not as important as the falling apart of the, gov of, of the party he led. And it, it seems to me, by the time I got to the end of all this, that I came up with a new thesis, and that is that in all the causes of the Labor Party split of the 50s, Robert Menzies was a very big factor. If Robert Menzies hadn't been there, and Evett hadn't been leader of the Labor Party, it could have all been a different story. But Evett was so fired up about Menzies, and so consistently erratic in his own mind, that he destroyed not only himself, but he destroyed the party. Anyway, as Paul Kelly said, it's Shakespearean in its possibilities. I look at forever as a bit of a Greek tragedy for the Labor Party. Um, whether it should be made into a movie like Michael Kirby thinks, I don't know, forget that. And Netflix isn't out there. But enjoy it. And uh, thank you very much, Greg. Um, I did want to do a little bit of a discussion between Anne and Greg. I realise we are on time now, so if you do need to leave right now, I absolutely understand. We'll not be distressed, but we might just go, now I have the two of them here, and um, it's such a precious opportunity to have a chat with them for 10 minutes and, um, and close at 10 past 7, so I hope that doesn't delay everyone's dinner plans or glamorous plans that you might have. <laughs> Uh, now, we're, we're sharing microphones here, so at least we're in a post-COVID era, so I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, and I might just start with you. I'll, sorry. <laughs> Greg, I can share. Um, if, as you say, Evert was you know, um, really you know, responsible for the Labor split, he was unable to... Um, win the war with Menzies. He won the battle on the Communist Party referendum but didn't win the war. Why did Labor keep sticking with him for nine years? Well, you could say, why did they keep him as the leader after the official election? Uh, today, if you'd lost two significant elections, um, well, he did, wasn't leader in 51, but Labor lost 51, and then in 54, when he had a grand chance after winning the referendum case, um, I would have thought they'd have removed him. Um, but they hung on to him. And th there was an element of, of adoration about Everett because he was so well qualified academically. He was a very brilliant lawyer in his own way. Um, he could master a brief very quickly. He could um, put together arguments, whatever. Um, he could also annoy the High Court judges, which didn't help him in the banking case. Um, but they, they just couldn't take off him. They couldn't ask him to go. They couldn't. And there was no one that would stand against him. For example, Corwell supported the groupers in the mad caucus meeting where Everett stood on a table and screamed at everyone and denounced them all and virtually set the split off. Corwell, who did become leader eventually, he, was, he sided with the group that were being condemned. But when it came to a chance to put his hand up, he never did. Um, he eventually stumbled into it when they eventually moved Evett onto the um, Supreme Court of New South Wales, which was a deal done with the New South Wales government. But by then, you know, he, he'd also gone to the, I think it was 55 election, 58 election, they moved his seat because he was nearly beaten by Nancy Wake in, I think it was 54, um, or 51, I can't remember which one. But, but the problem was they were mesmerised by him. And then after it all fell apart, I can't remember what the anniversary was, 91, 51, 40th anniversary. All the Labor scholars got together, Michael Kirby was there, and they had a huge, big seminar day, and they all stood up, and with the exception of the barrister Roddy Maher in Sydney, who <laughs> had his own way of putting him down, the rest of them just all built his image. And, and when I was going through um, politics in the 80s and 90s, you couldn't say a word against him. The Ever Society is up there. Now, I'm not saying Everett didn't have his qualities and whatever, but if you were in the Labor Party, 
I could never understand why the adoration of it, because it was a disaster, which is what your point. But that's my answer. They just couldn't get over the notion that he was such a great mind. And you remember, these were the days when, especially in the Labor Party, but even on the non-Labor side of politics, not a lot of the members had degrees. I mean, Earl Page was a medical, had a medical degree, and Menzies was very erudite and all the rest of it. But, you know, an awful lot of them were business people, and in Labor they were, they were trade unions. Uh, I, do, I do feel like we're giving Ebbett a bit of a tough run tonight, and I'm going to be... I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to give him a bit of a plug. I, I studied international law here at Melbourne University and, uh, and then did my Masters um, at the LSE in public international law. So the contribution Ebbett made to the international legal system, the international rules-based order post-World War II is, is astounding, I think. Uh, and to think that Austra an Australian was the first president of the United Nations General Assembly, I think that's something we should all be hugely proud of. Uh, Menzies saw Evert as a, as a rather naive liberal internationalist. Menzies is definitely a realist in, in foreign policy when you see all the decisions he's taking. And he's nimble as well. Um, Greg, do you... What do you think of the of the Evert legacy to Australia's place in the world and its and it, and and the outlook he presented on uh, international affairs? Well, uh, Georgina, characteristically, you and Anne, of course, are much nicer to him than I am. I mean, I, I think he was both barking mad and bad and dangerous to know, and he wrought nothing but disaster in Australian politics. I mean, he destroyed the Labor Party, as Anne says. He drove out all the anti-communists out of the Labor Party. Uh, one of the reasons the Labor Party in Victoria is so dreadful today is because of Evert. And um, he, he drove a demographic away from the Labor Party, which should have been the salt and yeast of the Labor Party. And um, he was nasty, and uh, he defended the Soviet Union. I mean. How heroic is this? What sort of international liberal rules-based order sees the Soviet Union and human rights and says, you know what, I'll choose the Soviet Union. Sees the Soviet Union and Australian national security and says, guess what, I'll choose the Soviet Union. But I'd offer you this other reflection. So the Labor Party has produced very fine governments. I mean, I certainly you know, voted for Bob Hawke and I've got to say I voted for, for Paul Keating too. And, um, in retrospect, I have the greatest uh, admiration for John Howard, but, but, and I think Kim Beasley was a great, uh, great Labor leader. But the Labor Party occasionally falls in love with intellectuals, and it's always a disaster. It's always a disaster. Keeping Evert on was crazy, but imagine sticking with Whitlam after 1975. I, so when a, when a person dies, you should speak very respectfully of them. I absolutely agree with that. And Whitlam was in many respects a, a noble, dedicated public servant. But he, in my opinion, was the worst Prime Minister in Australian history by a mile. And he got repudiated in what Anne will tell you was the second biggest electoral landslide in Australian history. When he died, there were a lot of TV and radio programs trying to assess his legacy. And I always started out by trying to be very polite and express condolences and thanks for his contribution to Australian life. And then, talk about some of the, the bad stuff. And I remember I was doing, um, uh, must have been the drum, I think, with, with the normal cast of, you know, left-wing folks, and they were saying, you know, Whitlam made us proud to be Australian. Australians loved him, you know, they just, you know, the sun shone because of Whitlam's genius and we felt happier about ourselves. I said, but hang on a minute. He lost two elections by massive landslides. If they felt so proud of him, why did they repudiate him in 1975 so overwhelmingly? And then when they had the chance to think it over and reconsider and have another shot in 1977, they repudiated him again, almost in identical proportions. Now, the reason I make all that digression is that the left in Australia is magnificent at controlling history. They build their legends and they build their narratives and their narratives often have no relationship to reality at all. Just no relationship to reality at all. So what a genius act it was by Whitlam to, in Evert's tradition, to recognise Soviet de jure sovereignty 
over the Baltic states. He was on the right side of history there, wasn't he? That was, that was brilliant. Or to reject the idea that we should accept any Vietnamese refugees whatsoever. Um, they didn't ring the withers of his heart and he wasn't going to have those uh, Asian bolts coming into this country with their religious and ethnic prejudices against him. Everett and Whitlam both, two of the most destructive leaders Australia has ever had the misfortune to experience, happily rejected by the wise Australian people who are a naturally Labor voting uh, group of people. They, they want to elect sensible Labor governments. You know, you give them a Bob Hawke or even a Neville Rand and they'll they'll vote for him every day of the week. But Labor gets seduced sometimes by these intellectuals. I think Anne makes a very powerful point that most folks in those days, I think whenever Menzies went to university, probably 1% of the Australian population went to university. And you, you, would, you would think, geez, you know, I can't understand a thing he says, but he's pretty smart, isn't he? And he's on our side, that's great. Until actually you really look into him and then, you know, like Eddie Ward nearly nearly committing suicide after the Molotov moment, or the wonderful motion that was going to be put to the caucus when Everett was appearing before the Petrov Royal Commission to ban the leader of the party from speaking about the Royal Commission outside of approved lines already, you know, authorised by the caucus. And Anne tells that they, they withdrew that motion then because it would have been so embarrassing for the leader. Again, I'll finish on this point. A bit like after 1975, when it became clear that Gough Whitlam had commissioned Bill Hartley, remember Bill Hartley? Had commissioned Bill Hartley to go to Iraq and solicit election funds from the Iraqi Ba'ath Socialist Party for the Labor Party, the federal executive of the Federal Labor Party censured Gough Whitlam and then he was re-elected leader. You know, it's a, a very... Sometimes Australian politics, whatever it is, it's not dull. It's a very, very strange thing, Australian politics. Uh, I think we would love to keep going, um, Greg and Anne, but I do note it is now 7.10. I should note, too, that Arthur Corwell almost kicked Gough Whitlam out of the Labor Party over the state aid issue, too. So Gough Whitlam almost never was Prime Minister, um, but for some, I think, Queensland Labor Labor wrangling in his favour. Um, so, from from this point, I will have to thank Anne and Greg for um, a most wonderful um, set of remarks. Greg, thank you very much for launching Anne's book, and thank you for giving us the pri privilege of hosting your launch here. Um, there are some books of Anne's for sale over at the back there with Dr Gorman on, on sales and I'm sure she'd be very happy to sign them if you'd like a scribble in the books and we have some other books as well available. Um, we do have some upcoming events, I'll just give a quick spruik to uh, Menzies Oration and Gala with Fraser Nelson, editor of The Spectator on the 19th of October down at the Windsor Hotel and the launch of Brett Mason's new book, Saving Lieutenant Kennedy, The Heroic Story of the Australian Who Helped Rescue JFK, will be launched in this room by Peter Costello at the end of this month on the 31st of October. And also in this room is our third annual conference, The Menzies Ascendancy, Implementing a Liberal Agenda and Consolidating Gains, over two days with 16 fabulous speakers. So I really welcome you to that. But without further ado, thank you very much.